Well, here we are in episode 100 of Pedalbox, sat in the middle of what was once meant to be a Haynes Roadster, and what is yet to be... we don't really know what yet. Yep, and middle is definitely the right word, because while it's been four years, and as Chris said, a hundred episodes, we still have quite a distance to go before we get to the end. And here's where we started, our eBay chassis in all its yellow and rusty glory. Built as best we can figure from the plans in Ron Champion's book, later republished by Haynes, build your own sports car for £250, this one then being abandoned, never having seen so much as a nut or a bolt. Designed for a live axle with a parallel rear and independent front suspension, probably with a four cylinder in the front, we ditched that idea along with the mishmash of incomplete parts we got with it and trod our own path. Our own path wasn't exactly mapped out though. Deciding most traditional engines were a little bit too humdrum, we opted for a VW Audi 4-cylinder transverse 20-valve turbo mid-mounted. That meant everything behind the seat back had to be cut off. And to hold the engine and gearbox up, some comically oversized 80mm steel box section got filleted into what was left. Next up, we need to sort out suspension. The TT has some convenient, if extremely heavy, cast trailing arms for the rear that use the same size hubs and drive shafts as the front, and we just need to add some steel for the forward mounts to connect onto. But everything inboard intersects with both the block and the sub, where the differential subframe would normally connect to. That means every single hookup needs redesigning, and neither I nor Chris are engineers, much less automotive engineers. We ended up creating some rear suspension that had unsettable geometry because the top pin on the hub was completely free to move, being suspended between two hind joints and it itself also being a hind joint. This meant it wobbled around in free space and you could never set the tracking accurately. The shock tower is best described as an evolving design using parts we had lying around including suspension from a Mark II Golf and top mounts from a Subaru Forester. So after three or four months of trial, welding, adjustment and errors, we had wheels that held the car up, bounced up and down, and took the original drive shafts from the diff. The McPherson's from the first Donut A3 and indeed that of the TT clearly wouldn't work on this style of car, at least not without some fairly radical and probably controversial styling choices. So we got to work chopping off yet more of the chassis, this time at the front. It turns out in places our tube chassis was more of a pipe chassis as it contained quite a bit of water and unfortunately this wouldn't be the last time we cut into something that had been welded closed only to find it leaked. After that we set about hacking together a new frame for the bottom of the car that would take the standard A3 lower arm which would allow us to use the A3 hubs as well and in place of the shock absorber fashioned a small round peg that was the same diameter to put in, in its place that we could attach the top end of a custom upper arm to to create some more traditional independent front suspension. Then came the culmination of the first 12 months work on the project bolting all of the parts on we'd had individually attached all at once to make sure that everything did actually fit together properly and we could, roughly speaking, count on it to work. In classic Haynes fashion, reassembly is just the reverse of disassembly, although we'd never fully disassembled the car to this state, so perhaps that was oversimplifying it a touch. During lockdown in 2020, stuck at home and able to go anywhere, I made good headway on crafting the overall profile of the car. This involved adding a windscreen and an associated surround to mount it to, as well as a rollover hoop behind the seats and some A-pillars to attach the windscreen surround onto. I also started framing out the bodywork to get a little bit better idea of what the shape of the car was going to be. Two years later, with the bodywork well underway, I'm still trying to decide on whether or not I want to add some quarter lights to the A-pillars so that it will deflect some of the wind around the windscreen rather than having anybody sat in the seats buffeted by the wind wrapping around where you would normally have wing mirror mounts. Now, if we do decide to put A-pillar windows in, we're going to follow a fairly similar method to how we built the windscreen, which is we're going to finish off the rest of the skin over here and figure out roughly where it has to sit 
and then we're going to go on eBay and go next page, next page, next page for a very long time until we find a window that looks about the right dimensions for what we need. So let's say we sort of come down to here, we're then going to get the glass and then make up the frame to suit. And because we're inevitably going to get the frame wrong, we're going to have to do something like this, where we put plating material in, just to sort of take up the edges where we put mistakes in, because we're definitely going to do that. Now, one thing that we don't want to emulate from our windscreen is the uh, sort of general knackeredness of it. This one looks like it's been about four, in about four different crashes. In reality, it was on the chassis when we flipped it over on the spit roast, so it fell on the floor and broke. It had also already at that point been dropped onto some bits of weld in the bottom of the frame there, which had also chipped it and broke it. And since then, it's just, you know, we obviously stopped caring and we just beat the snot out of it from then on. So it's uh, definitely not in the happiest state. So we've got to get another one. Actually, no, we have another one. It's in the house. We've just been babysitting it and making sure we don't break it. And this one's kind of a sacrificial lamb while we're building everything. But it does let us make sure that the windscreen wiper placement and everything works reasonably. So, you know, it's doing its job. So moving forward a bit down the car, we get to the front end, which I basically roughed out whilst Chris wasn't here. He was uh, away, um, stuck at his folks during lockdown, and I just kind of got carried away. I bought a load of 10 mil tube, and I built a framework up and roughly worked out what it was going to look like, as well as doing the roll cage, and generally framing in a bunch of the stuff on the windscreen, as Chris was mentioning before. So the first thing I ended up doing was buying some headlights. These are off an Alpha 159, and there's another one that uses the same one that I can't remember, but they basically do a four-door and a state and a coupe and a convertible, all using these lights, which is quite nice. So these ended up going in on a removable uh, framework that unbolts from the underside of the chassis and the whole radiator support that sits about here and that whole unit comes out. Now, there's two screws that hold that in, which is why we had to make more changes when we built the front lip, because you can't actually get the headlight in or out. Now we put the bodywork on. Womp womp, that was a little bit of a mistake on my part. Now coming down a little bit on the car, this is the original crash barrier we used off the back of the A3. TT had one as well, but we decided not to use that because we'd already built one with the one off the original A3 donor, and there was no real point in changing it. The front crash bars were no good, they had big protrusions and pushed them way further forward from their mounting point. So this was a nice simple package that fit on and just gave us a defined point for the very front of the car. Even if we did actually have to put the big spacers in to carry the headlights because we sort of underestimated just how long this car needed to be. It's kind of a running theme on this, we just need to keep adding bits and adding bits and adding bits. So getting this in, the headlights in and all of the stuff at the back and defining the overall size of the car was a really big moment. And unfortunately, that basically all happened while Chris wasn't here. So we recently obviously put the bodywork on, the uh, wings on both sides, and we started building the bonnet as well. Now, the bonnet was going to be welded from this front edge with this nicely rolled piece over. It's going to go all the way back to the front of the scoop, and that bit was going to be welded on. And we decided when we were building the bonnet, that wasn't the way we were going to go only because we weren't going to be able to get a nice looking join between this panel and however we were going to fix this part of the panel, which actually goes around the back of the scoop and around the sides, to, to join in a nice kind of clean looking way. Uh, so we decided the whole thing was going to be removable and we redesigned it basically on the fly. Now looking down underneath, there's obviously a big piece missing, which is the um, splitter, which is going to come out from the bottom of the framework. It's going to have a little bit of a kind of diffused angle on the back, just to try and give us a little bit more front down force. We've been advised that that should work, and it's very easy to do, so we've built that in already. And the splitter is going to come out a little bit proud of the very front edge of the car. And we also need to roll this, well, not roll this over, but we need to extend this part down, so we actually have a front edge to the car. Unfortunately, that means that we're going to have to modify our crash bar slightly so that we can bolt it on by just lifting it into place and running the bolts through, because at the moment we have one stud and one bolt. So we're going to have to work out how to get that stud out, because we can't get anything in, like an angle grinder won't get in easily into the box section that we extended for the headlights. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge yet to be done. And the scoop itself comes out from our radiator, which has two fans, uh, smaller fans of the two that normally fit on the TT and the A3. They have one big, one small. And the two small ones are still ample for what we need, and even still a little bit bigger than our radiator, which is off a Porsche 944. So that sits in at an angle, and then it just drafts up and over the top. 
We spent quite a while wondering which way we were going to go with it, whether we'd have top exit or side exits behind the wheels for the hot air coming off the radiator. And we didn't really know how much of it was going to be sucked into the intercooler sections, which Chris will show you in a minute. But we eventually ended up with it's going to be much easier, given all of the other stuff underneath the bonnet, to just have it ducting straight out over the top and just blowing around. So I'll just show you what's actually underneath the bonnet. And the plan is eventually to have this hinging across the front of probably these braces across here. So we need to find some hinges that'll work for us and it will just give it a little bit of lift and then bend across, which are actually quite common on cars now. So that should do quite easily for that. And then under here, as we mentioned earlier, we have the fuel system, pedal box, all the hydraulic systems are down here, although currently covered in a mixture of dirt and rust and bits of aluminium from when we've been doing all sorts of stuff. So this whole area needs a really good clean before we get properly done on this. But you might be able to see the radiator and fans down there a little better. We have ducked over the top of here for when we expected it to be welded in. And we have a hastily butchered Smart for four, no, sorry, Smart for two uh, windscreen wiper arrangement where the motor was on this side in the middle of the car. We realized if we left it like that, we were going to trap our fuel cell. And then having built the scoop, we then almost trapped the fuel cell permanently in the car. Moving back along the car here to the back of the passenger cell, you can start seeing some of the first signs of the actual running gear, the beating heart of the car. Just here we've got some nice blue silicon pipe to get boost out of our intercooler. There's another one the other side. This is basically the same as the Audi TT that we pulled this 20 valve turbo engine in the back from. The only difference is we've swapped in a pair of turbo turbos, a pair of intercoolers from Aid's old crashed A6. And the only reason we did that is because the boost inlets and outlets on them are perfect mirror images of each other on both sides of the car. So it made mounting them and figuring out all the ducting and everything a lot easier. To keep these fed with nice cool air to cool down the hot boost out of the turbo, we put these ducts down the side of the car to make sure there's plenty of air available to them. This is obviously not like a carefully optimized, aerodynamically uh, perfect duct, not like a NACA duct or anything. But nonetheless, there's enough area here and everything to, uh, to probably do a fair bit of work, especially by the time you add on the third intercooler that we've added in the back that we stole from a Land Rover Freelander. Also visible is the first piece of bodywork we did, and this is an absolute nightmare. I hated every second of it. So this bottom section here in the inner section is one piece of steel that we kind of pressed into the framework and skeleton that we had here. And the trick that we came up with to try and make it work was to take a big piece of scaffold bar, run it along here, press it into, the, uh, into where we wanted that bend to be, and basically pull it inwards with a ratchet strap. Somehow, it actually turned out okay, but it really did kick our backsides for a couple of days while we figured it all out. So now moving to the very back of the car, you can see what we did. And this was an idea that was in my head for a long, long time, although it did go through some design changes whilst I was building it. Originally, this line came out, and the line at the edge of the car went up, and it came into a square. And I was going for a bit of a, almost a Ferrari F40 kind of style, with the black mesh across the back, square edge up, wing down, brilliant. Would have looked really good. And then I found these headlights after probably two or three months of chasing and looking for decent headlights that worked. Uh, headlights, tail lights that worked. And these ones actually came off another Alfa Romeo. The front ones came off an Alfa 159. These are off an Alfa Romeo Mito. But this one is from the uh, left of the car, and that one's from the right. And we basically cut a bunch of the mounting uh, plate off that fits onto the bodywork and fits onto the panel at the back of the regular car, sliced that down, and then made our own mounts and fit them in. And having put them in, I then thought, God, it would look really nice if it just kind of rolled over the top around the edge of the lights. So I did. I basically sliced it off right the way to the top of the arch and put in the new piece of steel around the top when I was fitting the bodywork. And I've got to say, I really, really like it. Other difficult bits to get have been connectors for this uh, mini rear light. So this is fog light and reversing lights from a, I think, roughly 2012 Mini 1. And that wasn't that hard to find. I eventually found one on eBay. But I haven't been able to find a connector for it. So I need to still need to find one of the minis in the scrapyard and pull the connector off. And then obviously our back box, which we've done fairly significant modification to at this point, it's from a Subaru or, well, Subaru or Toyota, BRZ or GT86, depending on your flavor of manufacturer. But this 
should give us enough silencing. This is apparently quite over-silenced on the original car. So we're hoping that with a very short exhaust, no mid-silencer, and just the one big back box, that should give us enough. And if it's too quiet and we want a little bit more noise, we'd always make a custom one later. I'm not entirely sure if I'm keeping these tips on. Let us know in the comments what you think, whether or not we should keep these oversized tips or go down to the smaller inner size pipe or put something a little bit less big on the end. But one way or another, we'll decide on that later on. Now moving further back again, give you a bit more of an overview of the engine that we've obviously not quite seen yet. We've seen some of the boost system further forward, but this is where all the magic happens. This is a 20-valve turbo uh, BAM code engine out of a Gen 1 Audi TT. Makes about 225 horsepower uh, when it's not full of random bits of aluminium dropped into parts of it. And um, it's a nice little lump. The only downside of it that I can think of is an iron block. So it is relatively heavy, but I think we've got more than enough power here to push through that weight disadvantage. So you've got the turbo sitting on the back of it, feeding boost to our rear-mounted intercooler from the Freelander that I mentioned earlier. You've got two nice big electric cooling fans blowing air across it. It is going to be warm in here, but since this is fresh directly out of the turbo, the boost is going to be so hot that even the warm air that's in here should still do a lot of cooling work on it. We then run the boost all the way forward into those two side-mounted intercoolers, and then it eventually comes back in the front, tucked away under a nice little aluminium heat shield here. We've got the exhaust, the turbo, and the full custom exhaust pipework system that we've had made up. And I said it again. <coughs> That we made and had Absolutely. welded, had professionally welded, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And underneath our nice shiny aluminium heat shield here, we've got the rest of the exhaust systems. The turbo's hidden away under there where most of its heat hopefully won't make it into the boost pipes. And we've got our custom exhaust system. So we made all of that up ourselves and then sent it off to someone who knows what they're doing with a welder so they could back purge it with, um, with argon or CO2, whatever it is that they use, and fully weld it up. Because obviously that being stainless steel, we can't really do that with our little MIG machine here. But that's all looking really, really nice under there. I would show you, but I'd have to kind of dismantle a lot of the boost piping and take the heat shield and everything off and it's all bolted in. So you're just going to have to take my word on that one. Or go revisit an older episode where we did it. And just bringing our attention up a little bit, I do, I got to say, I really, really love this engine bay cover. We've even done the very luxurious feature of adding a gas ram to it so that we don't have to deal with, you know, props or anything to hold it up. So that closes really nicely, just like that. And also just to cover up some of the, or to fill up rather, some of the gaps between this, because obviously we, you know, we didn't get the sizing exactly right. Aid has basically used the welder as a 3D printer and has built a lip off of this entire rear panel to take up all that gap. If you look at the other side, which I think Aid will probably cut to in a second, you can see there's obviously quite a large gap there that we've had to seal up. But this side's looking really, really nice. And I think we can mirror that both sides quite easily. Now, for quite a long time, the middle section of the car, the cockpit, was the most complete looking part because it had a lot of its services installed. Handbrake is in, the gear stick is in, although it doesn't have its gear cables yet to run into the gearbox. They only go in this far. They're missing better part of two and a half meters of their reach. We also have the fuse box in, the wiring is in and has been thinned down. That was a mammoth job, uh, and that took us probably the better part of a month just to trim the uh, wiring loom down so that we got rid of things like the air conditioning system, the airbag system, because we have no airbags and we have no air conditioning, although this will have a heater, it will be running on an external circuit uh, running off the uh, main battery supply rather than running through the fuse box. It will have its own fuses in as well, so we don't want to integrate it into this because it was easier to just rip all that out. So There's all kinds of LEDs for vents and who knows what coming out of that. So there's a few more bits we need to put into this. We need to decide if we're going to cut a window in the back as well and then install a um, rear view mirror, which will probably be one with a camera in forwards and backwards or something. I'll see what we can find for that. Obviously, we need to put the seats back in and the floor on. Now, the floor I built out of uh, plywood a couple of years ago as well. And even though the whole thing was covered up just atmospherically, it absorbed so much water, it warped and twisted. And some of it is basically banana shaped. So I got rid of that and I remade it all in phenolic plywood. So that is resin impregnated on the top and bottom. It is completely sealed. It's really nice. Doesn't let any water into it. Obviously we've cut it, so the edges need something, but that's gonna be very easy to seal compared to the whole top of it, where I put a waterproof stain on before, and I think I did two, possibly three coats in the end. It didn't seal the wood, and it absorbed a load of water from the atmosphere and bits that dripped in, and basically it ruined itself. So if you need any curvy plywood, I am apparently your man.
Now, the other bits we've got installed include the steering column, although it's not fitted yet. That's ready to go with all of its controls and levers and switch gear that needs to fit into the center. All of the loom for that is done. The pedals are done. All of the pedal services are in. The, it's a fly-by-wire throttle, which we had to redesign because originally the engine was out of the A3 and wasn't the BAM, uh, which is um, electric throttle, electronic throttle. It's fly-by-wire. It was a proper cable, which would have been easy to run round. But basically, we had to re-engineer the cable pedal box, accelerator pedal, for um, an electronic one. So the, we built a new linkage to fit in there, and that works really nicely now. So this is all sorted. The next big bit to go in here is actually the dashboard. And given we're going to have a heater, that's the next piece we kind of need to fit. Once that's done, we're actually going to put Dynamat in a bunch of this or something similar. Probably will be Dynamat. Um, and we're going to stop some of this tinniness around all of these panels because I really don't want to live inside a drum whilst we're driving this around. And this will be really, really annoying to live with. So that's all going to get quietened down. Hopefully you heard that on my microphone. I'm going to have to re-record it and add it in later. So that's as far as we've got with the car. We haven't started the engine yet because we might have cooked the ECU whilst leaving it attached and welding onto the chassis. We've got a few other bits that we need to sort systems-wise for the electronics to plug in and then we can get that lot done and buttoned up. And by that time, the rest of the bodywork should be on and we might be able to give this a full-scale test driving well, to the end of the drive, because it won't be road legal yet. Thanks very much for everybody who's supported us so far. If you'd like to continue to support us, you can buy some merch at shop.pedalbox.show, and you can support us more directly at patreon.com forward slash pedalboxshow, where you can start donations from as little as a dollar a month. We also have our Discord access for access levels above $5, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we'll see you in the next episode.